and I'm very glad that well, you guys are talking to each other. <laughs> Sometimes when people just show up, they're really quiet. They don't say hi to their neighbors. But okay, how many people know people to their left? You guys know them yet? Say hi, say hi. How many people to your right? You guys know people on your right? Cool. Well, I, I want to welcome everyone uh, for tonight. Tonight's uh, API domination. Um, and with IBM and our um, our guest presenter here tonight, um, Giuseppe is at a, a, a local uh, evangelist for IBM, and he's going to share a little bit about the platform that he's evangelizing for. How many people are are, are no, no no developers? There are no hit this. Are you unicorn? No, no, it's a few. Okay, cool. How many people have heard of Node? Right? It makes your life easier. Look at the big guys. How many people are like mobile app developers? Do front end stuff. How many people are back end? Like back end? Cloud, cloud developers? Cool. Any entrepreneurs here working on a startup? Wow. And then I'm curious, why are you guys here? Is it for networking? <laughs> is it for networking? Is it, okay, what is it? Are you here to learn something, right? No. Two, is networking, maybe some industry colleagues? It's probably not for the food. I mean, I guess pizza. But, uh, was the pizza okay tonight? This is two boots pizza, I guess I've never. Yeah, they're better. Well, they're being stay half a so that's a combination. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, welcome everybody. My name is Mario Tapia. I, um, I've been gathering communities like yourselves since 1999, so focused on mobile developers. Back when it wasn't cool, um, and also back when it was before apps, and there was mostly mobile web, and we had our own, own, own different languages for developing. Um, and if you guys are tweeting, hashtag is mobile Monday for tonight. Um, I curate the uh, communities in Silicon Valley, so I live in San Francisco. And come out here every other month to do some tech event um, for the community, um, and also Los Angeles, and we also do some stuff in Chicago as well. So it's a, it's very unique to see different different developer communities and how what they're focused on and what they're building um, in all the different cities, and also the different industries that you guys because a lot of um, brands at at technology here in, in New York. If I go to, to Los Angeles, a lot of studios, movie studios, so basically the audience is a lot more people who work in the studio um, and entertainment business. And then Silicon Valley is a lot of tech. In Chicago, again, it's like McDonald's and Walgreens and consumer product stuff. It's kind of cool. Um, so, a little bit about how many people first time on Monday? First time? Cool. How many people are returning? Returning on Monday people? All right, cool. Um, so, for the first First timers, uh, this is our developer lab, so it's a form of technical session. We said we, we also have a, a meetup that is panel discussion, so ecosystem. So we'll have a panel of experts up on stage talking about uh, doing a deep dive into technology. Um, uh, and we also do roundtable dinners. Um, we record these, so uh, we have a YouTube channel. Um, so from all the different cities, we, we put these together. So if you guys are curious about certain technologies or just curious about what, what do you guys talk about on beacons, <laughs> beacon technology, or IoT, or um, connected car, or even, even some of the advertising technology uh, technologies, um, we do events there uh, on those different topics. And and probably for the next event we do something Valley, I'll start live streaming here. So if you're interested. Um, Time shift here, I think it'll be at 9 o'clock, 9.30 at night, so if you're at home, um, you can live stream uh, one of the next sessions that we're having on hyper growth um, for, for, for acquisition growth. Uh, also, one of the announcements uh, early June, we have a hackathon, so, and it will be here. So, um, the rooms next door and also here. Um, we top prize is 5K for the team. Um, plus, I think overall we've got 10K in cash and prizes overall, so we have multiple prizes and things like that. So, um, if you're a newbie for hackathons, still come. I think you'll. I think. I think with the stuff that you learn tonight will give you an advantage, a little head start. Um, but also, um, if you have some idea of building something cool, um, or if you want to start putting your team together, um, you know, we we take developers. You don't know, all have to be developers. You can be an idea person as well, um, product person. And you could also um, be like a designer, front end, like designers. So, 
Um, I'll, I mean, I'll start bombarding you with a bunch of emails. If you guys want to find out more. But uh, I think it'll be a great, fun weekend. Um, spend early June and um, some great prizes as well. So, also where to find us. So, mobilemonday.us is our website. You can check that out. Um, spent some time on Squarespace the last couple of weeks. Kind <laughs> of do that. Um, and then Meetup is Mobile Monday New York. How many people are in Meetup? The Pilots New Meetup, great. How many people got us through our newsletter? The newsletter, okay. And then um, YouTube, Mobile Monday SV is our channel. So check out YouTube. Um, and, and also I'd like to thank, give a round of applause to the Strong Group and the Alliance for hosting us tonight. So, Um, so, I forgot about the important information. Where's the restroom here? Uh, I think it's over there and either to the right or the left. They're usually little signs. Okay, so, okay. Important to <laughs> Restrooms, out this door, take a right, go down the hall. Somewhere over okay, there. Follow the signs. Yeah. Okay, and that's about it. I think uh, some of the news left. Why are you asking for Wi Fi? Oh, Wi Fi. So, there is free Wi Fi, galvanized. Um, there, there's three galvanizes, but there's a public galvanized or a community galvanized guest. Galvanized guest, and then there's like a Facebook. Uh, Jump through some booths there. That's uh, the free Wi-Fi, um, and that's it. And also for tonight, um, for, for Joe, um, ask questions. So this will be interactive. So he'll go through the presentation. Go too fast. Raise your hand. Ask him some questions. Um, we're all learning here, so. Um, and that's the objective, so um, please don't be shy. Um, and uh, so I'll introduce Joe. Joe, give me a round of applause to you. I am Joe Seppi. I work for the Strong Team at IBM. Um, can, can everybody hear me if I want to talk like this? It's all right? Good. So my presentation is fairly loose. Uh, my slides are really just to kind of help keep me on track. So like Mario said, feel free to chime in, tell me to slow down, ask questions, whatever. Uh, you know, feel free to be interactive with us. Um, yeah, so Strongloop is a company that IBM bought about a year and a half ago, or we're getting close to two years. Um, Strongloop was really deep in the Node community. They uh, took over Express, which is a web uh, framework that's most widely used in the framework. The majority of Node applications out there are running on Express. And they also built a tool called Loopback that uh, sits on top of Express and is designed to rapidly build out APIs, uh, full, you know, RESTful CRUD APIs. Um, it's a really pretty cool tool, and I'll, I'll show it to you in a few minutes. Um, but it's really impressive in how fast you can get an API layer up and running. And you don't really need to know any code to, uh, to, to be able to do it. So I think a lot of the stuff that we'll, we'll talk about today, you don't need to necessarily know uh, JavaScript or Node.js. Um, so we'll just kind of go through some things. And, and yeah, feel, hopefully you can follow along and feel free to to ask any questions. Um, so, why APIs? Who? So, uh, I think only like a, a few folks here are developers, is that right? Are, are people largely like product people? Raise your hand if you're product. Yeah? I figure out what everyone else is, is uh, their, their deal. Anybody else want to volunteer what they do? That's different from a product and developer? Yeah, product or developer. UX, UI design. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent. All right, great. Well, so why APIs? Uh, if you start, especially with an API first approach, then you end up building a foundation that separates your concerns, your, your front end from your back end, and it really kind of sets you up to be able to have more of a platform that you can build on top of. So whether you're building a mobile app or a web app or uh, an Alexa integration or, or what have you, you know, Slack, Twitter. If you have APIs, then you can easily leverage your data, your business logic, your platform, 
Um, famously, Amazon, uh, what's his name, Jeff Bezos, I think like maybe 10 or 12 years ago, mandated that the company move completely to APIs. Everybody, every team, every organization in the large organization needed to expose APIs and interface with the other teams within Amazon through APIs. And it sort of set up a, a contract between everyone for how they know to, to work with each other. You know, they can look at their APIs or their documentation and know like what to expect if, if they need to interact with each other, get different uh, products or, or, or what have you, I mean, any sort of uh, data or logic. And in that instance, it really revolutionized the company. Now, if you're a developer, maybe even if not, you, you, you know that a large part of the web runs on AWS and they built this huge developer platform, uh, which was really starting from, from that initiative. So that's, that's kind of one example of, of the power of moving to an API platform. Another is this concept of, of the API economy. And a colleague of mine gave a uh, keynote presentation at Node Interactive this year. And he walked through an interesting scenario that uh, that combined with a follow-up demo really kind of got me pretty inspired. And, and so I wanted to share what, what he talked about that day. He described this situation where, say you want to go out for dinner, and you want to order your food ahead of time. So say the restaurant has you know, an online menu, and you're able to order your food, and then get in your car and start driving there, and the food doesn't get fired until it knows that you're within a certain proximity. Your table is, is kind of ready for you based on how far away you are. Your uh, home system, alarm system and everything locks the house down after you exit the garage and whatnot. Uh, the city may have like a, a, a parking API that's integrated into your automotive uh, interface. And so that highlights a parking spot that's nearest to the restaurant for you. And everything kind of becomes like this seamless experience. And some of these things are available today, but a lot of them don't necessarily work together. And so that's kind of like the concept of the API economy that everybody's working towards exposing APIs to different applications, and they can all work together to provide this more integrated user experience, which, you know, in the end, wouldn't that be great if you just kind of pull out your phone, order your food, get in the car, and everything else kind of falls into place, you know? And even if you're running late on the way home, your, your home uh, AV system knows based on your GPS to start recording your favorite program or whatnot. So like it all worked together uh, really quite nicely. Um, so that's kind of another experience, uh, another reason why moving towards an API uh, platform would really kind of uh, move things forward and, and accelerate these like really rich user experiences. Um, so, how do we how do we move to that so that uh, that model? And, and one thing that I, that I wanted to talk to you about is Loopback, which which I mentioned earlier. Um, Loopback is an open source framework for rapidly building APIs. It's uh, open source meaning it's free for anyone to use. It's integrated into IBM's full lifecycle, uh, API lifecycle management product called API Connect, which we'll also look at today. But because it's a part of their product, but still this open source solution, it's got the full support of IBM and the API Connect team that's, that's continuing to uh, maintain it and keep it healthy and improve upon it. In fact, we just released version three a few months ago, maybe two months ago, and version four, which is a huge step forward we're, we're looking to release later this year, like maybe mid-year or, or, or in the fall. Um, so even though it's this open source tool, it's fully backed by, by IBM, and uh, it's this really great tool, which we'll, we'll see in a minute. Um, and so let's see here, okay, now this. So this is the, the website for Loopback. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna take a quick moment to show you Loopback in action. And one of the great things about it is that it's, it uses uh, the, the command line interface to 
to interactively walk you through building an API. And so you don't really even need to know any code. You just get in the term terminal, fire it up, and um, it'll, it'll walk you through what you need to know. So let's see. Um, so you need Node installed because Loopback is, uh, builds out a Node application. And with Node comes NPM. So those are really the only prerequisites. And then you just do npm install dash dash global loop back CLI. All right, I already have this installed, so I won't do that. Uh, but that will install the tool globally to your machine. You can use it in any directory to start building out an application. So we'll get started by creating a cats API, because the internet is run by cats. Oh, you want my pets? I already, oh, sorry. So we'll just say LB. LB is the short name for loopback, and that starts the initialization process for a loopback application. So we'll say, we're going to call the, the, the application cats. Uh, it, by default, assumes you want to create a directory called cats. Oh, that's way too small. Huh? I thought it was big, but it's not. Is that better? Everybody can read? Yeah? Good? All right. Um, so it, it, it assumes you want to create a directory called cats, which we do. So it's created that directory for us. It traverses into that directory to continue building out the application. We're going to use the latest version of, uh, of Loopback. And then here, it gives us four options for our starting point, like the, 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 yeah, the essentially the foundation that you want to start from for building Loopback application. The first one, the API server, is the one that I usually use because it has this built-in user authentication uh, model pre-configured for you. So when I want to have members of my cat application or, or what have you, it's already kind of there built in and we just extend it. Do you have a question, sir? Well, no, no, I'm just, you know, because I realize the problem. Uh, I want to, uh, uh, no, 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 no. Okay. Yeah. We can talk more should later. Take, should, should we take a picture of the command, basic command start? Uh, well, what's great is, uh, you know what, let me, let me cancel out of this. Or maybe you will provide that to words. So if you do lb dash dash help, which is a common, um, command line interface uh, um, command, dash dash help. It gives you a number of, of bits of information, which I'll just kind of scroll up, kind of tells you a little bit about it, some of the config. But most importantly, the last thing it tells you is all of the available commands. And one of the great things about Loopback is that it has really great documentation. Uh, it, it, it's got Getting started for uh, part one and part two that walks you through building out a loopback application, a bunch of which we'll, we'll look at today. Uh, but the documentation is great. Just loopback.io is the website, and then there's a docs link that, that uh, will get you started. So uh, I am going to just rm rf cats to get started again, which is totally fine. Uh, so again, we're going to do cats. It's going to create the directory for us. We're going to use the current version of the of the framework. So the other two, the other three options, the empty server is just a real, there, there's nothing pre-configured for you. The Hello World one has some, some basic uh, stuff built into it. And then the notes is like a notes application. So that gives you a, a richer example. So you could just do a, you could instantiate a notes application and then look at the code and see what's going on if you wanted to. Uh, like I said, I usually choose the API server one because when I need to do any sort of user roles, uh, I can extend the, the pre-configured user model so it works great. And it's got everything built in, like sign up and, and forgot password and all that stuff is baked into that pre-configured user model, so it's great. So we'll start with uh, the, that API server foundation. And then what it's done here is it's scaffolded our application for us, the files that we need uh, to run a loopback application. And it also created a package.json file, which is what Node uses to install all the dependencies that it, the application needs. So if you're unfamiliar, Node is a, a, a platform for running JavaScript outside of the browser. Up until 2009, it was just you would run JavaScript in the browser. And uh, in 2009, uh, a way was introduced to run it outside of the browser, using the browser's JavaScript engine, but you could run it on the server, you could run it in, you know, 
Arduino and, and other uh, IoT devices. So but what, what is really pretty powerful about Node and, and the way applications are built in Node is that a lot of things are abstracted into small modules and, and made publicly available. And there's this NPM tool, the Node Package Manager, where you can very easily use these packages into your application. So you don't, you're not reinventing the wheel every time you need to do you know, OAuth integration or even some simple you know, array manipulation or, or what have you. There's, there's a millions of packages in the Node uh, package repository in NPM. So that's really powerful. So what, what uh, Loopback did was created our package JSON, which has a list of all of the things that Loopback needs, and then it installs it for us. It's really, really nice. And then it outputs these handy commands to get us started, right? So the first thing we'll do is go into our cats directory, and then we will do, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll invoke the process of creating an API, and the way Loopback does it is, is it, it takes a model-driven approach, so it asks you questions about your data, and then we'll, we'll build it out uh, based on that. Some other approaches are to ask you what uh, CRUD methods you may want, and then you kind of put your data into it, but this way it takes a model-driven approach. You had a question? Yeah, I was just curious, is there any other way to create the application without uh, not using the command line interface? Sure. I mean, I don't want to hurry off track, we're gonna get there. No, that's a good question. So. Um, you can, on Bluemix, there's like a starter template, okay. and I'm sure there, you don't, need, you don't need to use Bluemix for it, it just has a little bit of uh, a debate to uh, be able to push the Bluemix easily. Bluemix is the IBM platform as a service, the um, uh, IBM uh, cloud platform. But there, I'm sure there are uh, other like boilerplates out there, loopback boilerplates, some that may have some pre-configured models already built in. Uh, you can also like initialize a loopback application, and then I'll show you what gets outputted from this, and you'll see that it's really pretty straightforward, and you could handwrite it yourself if you wanted to, but using the command line interface uh, makes it really nice, and you don't have to worry about typing it and spelling mistakes or whatnot. So, we'll do a quick API based on cats. So it is a cat API endpoint, it asks us what, what uh, type of data source we want to connect, and all of the common data sources like uh, NoSQL and, and MySQL, like uh, uh, SQL and, and, and NoSQL databases are, all the common ones are supported by IBM, but there are also a ton of, of uh, community supported ones that have been built out, so like GraphQL and, and other ones that are a little more on the, uh, on the, uh, you know, the perimeter. Uh, the community supports those. And I'll talk a little bit more about those in a couple of minutes. But out of the box, we can just use what's an in-memory database, but every time we restart Node, we'll lose the data, but that's okay because we're just doing a demo. It's very easy to set up a, a data store and get with that. So moving on, uh, we're gonna ch choose the persistent model, which is gonna keep our data in sync, and we're gonna expose it via the public API. We don't need to choose a custom plural because it, it's smart enough to just add an S. But it, it, it is even smart enough to convert like child to children and, and other conventional uh, pluralizations. We're going to choose a common model to be used for either the client or the server, but in this example it doesn't really matter, so we're just kind of doing a quick example. So now it's asking us about our data, right? So we're going to say uh, cats have a name. It, that name is going to be a string. You can see the other options there. String, string is the obvious one for this. We're going to say it is required, and it's blank by default. And we're just going to say, is this cat friendly, which is a boolean, true or false. And it's not required, but we're going to make it false for insurance purposes. So now if we just hit enter, we now have a, a working API, which I will show you. So that's how you run uh, a node application. You just type node period, and it gives me this output here. So as you can see here, we've got our predefined user model and our cat API. So based on just those couple of questions, we've got this full CRUD API. Now I can go in here, if I click on this, it populates it, and I can test this out, right? So if I just get rid of these things, 
and I say try it out. Is this can people read that too? Right? Uh, let's make it a little too big. And if I click try it out, it gives me some examples for how to do it, but it also gives me the response body and the 200 code saying that everything worked well, your API is working, we posted this uh, blob of data, this cat, to your cat API. And then if I scroll back up here to the get, I can click try it out again, and it returns that cat. So I'll just do another quick one just to show you. Uh, we'll say this one is Teddy. Right, so that's another 200. And I go back up to my get, and now we should have an array of two cats. There's Fluffy and Teddy. So just based on that command line interface and those few questions, we've got a Node API up and running. And you can push this to any server that will host Node, and you're off to the races, right? I mean, granted, this is pretty basic. We don't have any access control to set up or, or you know, anything beyond just a simple cat API. But I wanted to give you a quick example of how fast you can get up and running with Loopback, which again is open source, free to use, uh, NPM install it. You can start playing with it right now if you want. Although you should pay attention to my talk. Uh, so, let's see, getting back. I do it through the it's, uh, it gives me my notes. So, we did that. Uh, oh, yes, that's why notes are good. I forgot, I wanted to show you. Just that you, as you had asked, um, can you write this yourself? Can you just get uh, a loopback application up and running? So, let me get into here. So if we go into common, these are the two files that are outputted by the CLI, the, the model-driven uh, uh, command. And so this basically describes our API based on those questions. You can see in the top there's, just, there's some of the basic kind of meta information, but down here are the properties that we set. Right, so you could get in, you could, this is what, 20 something lines, 22 lines, you could get in there and write it yourself. Uh, but the CLI makes sure you don't have any spelling mistakes and everything's kind of uh, valid. And you'll also see down here, we've got validations, relations, ACLs, and methods. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about a couple of those in a minute. And I know a lot of folks aren't programmers, so I won't spend too much time in code. But you can see how easy this is to, to get up and running, even if you're not a programmer. It's, it's all pretty uh, accessible. And then it also creates this JS file that corresponds with it. And this is basically just a way to hook into, hook business logic into your, into your APIs very easily. Um, I was talking about the loopback docs. I'll show you very quickly if it doesn't take too long. Um, so this is an example of of hooking into that, that uh, so you drop this code into that file, and um, you, uh, well I guess it's not very clear what's going on there, but it's basically creating a, a um, this is mapping the publisher who is creating the model, the, 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 the data instance, it's mapping that to the data before it gets pushed to the data source. Anyway, I guess that's not really a great example. But it's, it's easy to get in there and, and say, for example, uh, before you push data to the data store, you can get the timestamp and attach it to the data. Um, if you're working with, say, books or something, you could make a query to the Amazon um, the database to get, like, the, what do you call that, the ISBN, and attach that to the data store. So you can do a, a number of, you know, any, any number of things to, uh, to your data before you push it to the data store or before, after, what have you. So, getting back. As I mentioned before, there are lots of uh, data sources that are supported by IBM. Oh yes, this is, I just blew it up so it probably wasn't in the front. Um, so here are the connectors. So these are the ones that are uh, 
uh, supported by IBM directly and, and the Strongloom team. So you can see, you know, uh, Cloudant, uh, MongoDB, MySQL, Oracle, Postgres, uh, SQL Server. Uh, there's a handy email one, uh, push for push notifications. Uh, the rest one we'll look at in a moment too. Um, so there are a number of, that, of conventional ones that are supported by IBM and Strongloom. And then, as I mentioned before, there are also these uh, community-supported connectors. And all this is on uh, open source uh, GitHub, so you can go in there and see what other people are doing. So for example, there's a, a, a graph one that an IBM team member is, is looking at forking and, and creating another instance of it, because it, it uh, uh, needs to be updated for his, for his use case. But it's all open source, so you can get in there and either fork it, or see what's going on and, and better understand what's happening. So that's data sources. You can also set up uh, <coughs> relationships between your data. And I'll, I'll go ahead and, and code a little bit of this too, just to kind of show you again. So if I do, uh, uh, we'll do a human API. And we'll kind of go through this, persisted, all the same kind of stuff. Um, common, and so we'll also say name, to string, it is required, blank. And we'll just for fun say age, which is a number, it is not required, and um, you know, we'll leave it blank. So now we have cats and humans. And let's see if I can live code this. Let me, let me, let me get the exact command. We'll, we'll use this help for us uh, relation. <coughs> right, so it's gonna, again, walk us through these questions to, to help us uh, get this all set up. So we're gonna say, uh, cat has, um, has one human. And, uh, yeah, that's fine. We don't need a foreign key. So the, the second two you don't really need to worry about. And so we'll say the same thing the other way around. We'll say a human can have many cats. So now, if we look at our code again, we'll see the JSON here, our relationships are set up. And I just need to refresh this. And now we've got a human one as well, right? All, all pretty accessible. And now, if we uh, if we fire up our application again, we will see that we have our our cats with an ID, so that's a specific cat. But we can also see uh, that cat, that particular cat, what uh, human it has uh, associated with. And conversely, we can do the same with the humans. So a particular human based on that ID, what cast does it have? You can get that data very easily. So as you can see, it's pretty easy to get relationships set up and move back. And again, it's, it's walking through this, this CLI, which makes it really super easy. And now we'll take a quick look at uh, ACLs, access control list. So if we push this API up right now, uh, anybody can do you know whatever they wanted with it because we don't have anything set up, right? So if we go in and now again we'll we'll take a look at the commands. I think it's ACL. Yep. So ACL. Now what you typically do when you're setting up access control lists in Loopback is you lock everything out down by default and then you add back permissions. And you'll see how that works in a minute. So we're going to say all existing models, all methods and properties, everything, all users explicitly deny access. Right? And then we'll go back and we'll say, uh, we'll say, yeah, all models, uh, all methods and properties, all of it, but only the user owning the object, the user that created the object, can uh, manipulate it. Right? And then the nice thing about this is this is all built out in an array. I think I did on both of them, right? Yeah. Yep, they're the ACLs. So in JavaScript, 
Uh, an object, the, the, the key value pairs are, the order is arbitrary, but with arrays, it is an ordered list. So you'll see by the, the square bracket that the ACLs are an array, uh, and so it goes to the first one, which is the one that locks everything down, and then it goes to the next one and, and opens some aspects of it up. So that's how a, a simple example of how you would manage ACLs in loopback. But again, as you can see, it's really, it's really super easy. It's, it's one of the reasons why I love going out and talking to, to people about loopback, because I feel like it really sells itself. Um, okay, what else are we going to talk about? I have a question. Yeah. For the ACL, um, can you show the array again? Sure. So it says principal ID dollar sign owner. If I wanted to identify a specific object in my database, would I put the object's ID in there? Or how does it work? Like, let's just say for some reason I have like one model with one entry that I have like want to put specific permissions on? Can I do that in this order? I don't think you can do like a specific data instance. Is that what you mean? Or a specific like model? Well, no, I'm, talking, like, I'm thinking in terms of MongoDB, I have a collection and I have one item in my collection that I want different ACL than another item in my collection. One particular item. Yeah, I think you might need to do a little bit more coding to get that to work. So that would come in the in the code like the human.js or cat.js. Yeah, file. yeah, that would be one way to do it. Um, I feel like there's another way you can do it, but I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, if you want to know more, you can talk offline. So this is a collection based. Yeah, yeah, so it's slightly higher level. If you need to get specific data instances, then, then yeah, you can get a little more. Get into the code. Yeah. Great. So, boy, that's a lot smaller than I imagined. Uh, but some other kind of more, you know, complex is a great word, but some other potential use cases that people may run into. Uh, and I'm going to use a couple of blog posts as, as uh, examples here. So, APIs for APIs. Um, one of my colleagues wrote this great blog post about building, like, essentially, taking other APIs, whether they're your own or third parties, and exposing them through your own application. So his example here, because he's a Star Wars nut, is uh, taking uh, the Star Wars API and not only wrapping it through his application, but taking the response that comes from the Star Wars API and manipulating it before serving it out. So I think he, uh, uh, instead of getting the full data that, that comes from the Star Wars API, he just returns like a list of the ships. Uh, so that's like one example. I mean, you could, you could pretty much wrap any public API and expose it through your API as well. Uh, but that's like one example that, that he was uh, uh, talking about. And then... Let's uh, Sure. Yep. Yeah, I think I think when you're doing this is using the uh, REST connector. I think you need to get in and, and, and write a little bit more since you're kind of doing. It's not like a data store connector. You're actually doing like REST to REST sort of thing. Right. So you need to kind of set up a template so that it knows what is going to be coming through. If that makes sense. So. So if I have my API in loopback, and then I'm connecting it to Watson, then what am I doing? I'm mapping the Watson data to my own personal data structure, or is it just sending it directly through, just, I'm just swapping URLs or something? Or is it acting like a proxy? A proxy. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> cool. Cool. Uh, so yeah, APIs for APIs. Uh, another example is uh, a, a, a different colleague wrote this blog post about this fictional appliance store that has their products in a SQL database and their, and, and their parts in a CSV file. And so with, with Loopback, you can take that CSV file and be able to work with that and expose that through an API. So even if your data is in like a weird 
place a weird situation, there, there are ways to, to, um, to make it accessible through, through your loopback APIs. And then thirdly is uh, using your file system as a database. And there's, uh, there's one good example on, on our, our blog about, excuse me, um, building a static site generator. And again, this is probably too small. Uh, but, what is this? Um, so with this, uh, I'm getting a little off topic, but with a static site generator, if you're not familiar, it's basically building a blog that is not necessarily dynamic. You, you write your posts in little files, and then you run a command that builds your website, and then you deploy that. So they're all flat, static files. But the, in, in essence, you're using the file system as your database because you just have this directory full of posts. So there's, there's one, this isn't the post here, but there's another post on our blog about building your own static file system, uh, sorry, <coughs> static site generator with loopback. Uh, this, this post here is about just generally working with the file storage system. And, and Ray not only loves Star Wars, but he also loves cats. And so his example is, he, he's always building cat APIs, um, but it turns out that his his cats also have uh, photos and resumes because most of the users on LinkedIn are actually cats, uh, according to the internet. And so he built an example of using uh, resumes and images on your file system and being able to expose those through your your APIs as well. So those are a couple of like kind of a little unusual examples that you can still use loopback to expose. And then another thing I want to mention too is that, I think I mentioned earlier uh, at the very beginning that loopback is built on top of Express, which is a, a just basic web framework built in Node. And so another cool thing that you can do is basically serve your, your web views using loopback because it's an Express app. And so, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the concept of, of like single page applications versus uh, a page load for every page. And a while back, there was this movement where everybody went to single page applications, sort of like Gmail, uh, where you don't necessarily have these page loads and everything's Ajaxified. And then people went back because they lost some page performance because you have to load up all this JavaScript and all your data and you don't get as good search engine results. Anyway. It, it, it ended up going to a, a spot where people were doing this hybrid approach where on page load, you would get the full page, all the data, everything you need sent from the server and it was much faster and it was good for SEO. But then what you would do is, is what we call hydrate your application by backfilling all of the JavaScriptness to make it uh, Ajaxy, you know, where you can do like if you post a comment on Facebook, it doesn't reload the page, obviously, it just kind of makes a call and it posts uh, your comment once it's successful. So the great thing about Loopback is it's an express app. So you can use it to just serve your web views, and if you have your APIs, you can do this hybrid approach where you're calling your own API, getting your data, building out your web view, and serving a full web view right off the bat, rather than serving a, a, a templated HTML file that then you need to go and call your API, get your data, and then you know template your, your view. So you can do this like hybrid approach as well. So there's a lot of uh, flexibility in, in, in using Loopback. And so now I'm going to get away from Loopback and talk about a couple other technologies that, that are, are made better by APIs. Has anybody heard of serverless? I know there aren't a lot of developers, but it's a kind of a hot topic right now. So uh, one of the popular ones is Lambda, which is the uh, Amazon one. And then IBM, and I'm pretty sure Adobe worked on it as well. I always get confused with a couple of technologies. I think this one was IBM and Adobe created uh, OpenWhisk and gave it to the Apache Foundation, so it's fully open sourced. And um, it's actually really uh, easy to use and, and easy to work with credentials and everything, where I know Amazon can be a little tricky at times. Uh, so I wanted to show you uh, OpenWhisk real quickly. So, so serverless, for people who don't know, is basically a small snippet of code that is, 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 is stored, and when you need it, it, is, it a, a, a server instance is spun up very quickly, the code is executed, and then the instance is brought down. 
So that serverless is kind of a funny term because you are using a server, but it's for only a moment, and it's you know super fast. And and the benefit is that you're not paying for a server to sit there idly, like waiting for requests. You only pay for when that code is called. And and so uh, it not only is it good for you know it, it, it's it's um, less costly to run, but it's also very scalable. You know, you could hit this code a million times, and, and you know these platforms are prepared to to, to, to spin up the code as, as many times as you need. So I'll just show you an example. So if you go on to Bluemix, which right now you can do a 30-day free trial on Bluemix, but don't quote me on this or actually anything that I've said so far. Um, I think that they're moving to a freemium model, to where you can use a whole number of services in a light way. Uh, light versions of the services, and it's not time limited. So uh, I think that that's kind of coming pretty soon. But anyway, if you're new to Bluemix, you can sign up and get 30 days for free and start playing around with the stuff. It's really fun. So if you start with Bluemix, with uh, OpenWhisk, it gives you this hello world example. And as you can see, when it's called, it just returns the message hello world. But what's really cool, and this was just introduced, I think, a week ago, is uh, so I mentioned earlier that we have this product called API Connect, but Bluemix has now taken that that uh, a lot of the functionality and made it native to to uh, Bluemix, and so it's kind of built right in. You don't need to instantiate an API Connect application and or service and connect it to your application. It's kind of integrated right into into like OpenWhisk and uh, some of their other applications and services. So if we go in here and uh, let's see. So I turned this on earlier, but you can see that I, I have a small snippet of, snippet of code, and I'm exposing it through this API. And if I get into the Explorer here, which is not unlike the Explorer we were looking at earlier, the, the, this, this kind of thing. Um, and I like try it, I click this, I got my 200 response code and the message back. Right, so um, you could very easily set up uh, all sorts of code in, in these small snippets. Uh, there, I've even seen some talks recently where there are some websites that are fully serverless. Their front end, their back end, everything is, is running off of code like this. Uh, and they talk about you know, all the money that they've saved and, and like a lot of the DevOps and infrastructure stuff is, is handled for them. Um, so this is really pretty sweet, and I wanted to, let me just see if, because uh, like I said, my, my uh, slides are trying to keep me on, on track here. So yeah, all right, so another thing that I want to talk to you about related to OpenWhisk is there's this really cool tutorial that another one of my colleagues on the Bluemix side uh, wrote, and it's about making, um, let me see if I can make this up. Yeah. It's about doing uh, Slack integration using uh, API Connect and, and OpenWhisk. Is that probably too small? So if you just go to the IBM Bluemix uh, org and look at the OpenWhisk Slack, Slack app, there's this whole tutorial here, which is really great. Uh, it's actually a lot of configuration, so you don't need to be a programmer to, to, to do this. Um, and, it, and it basically builds a very simple uh, Slack integration for you. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's a lot of configuration. Uh, I shouldn't say a lot. It's, it's mostly configuration in terms of getting into Slack and saying, yes, this is my application, and then getting into API Connect and saying, this is how I map it to that. Uh, but it's really easy to walk through. And I wanted to show you what this ends up looking like. So let's see here. Uh, this one. So this is API Connect. Uh, this is the full lifecycle management tool that, that IBM has for your, for your APIs. It's again, pretty small. It's probably going to get all goofy if I blow it up. We'll try it. <clears throat> so this manages the creation aspect and like the security aspect and, and, and making things public and allowing developers to consume your APIs and get authentication keys and, and uh, uh, rate limiting and things like that, which I'll, I'll show you in a second. But in this example, in that tutorial, 
in, in the repository, you're, giving, you're given this uh, open API file, which is right here, this thing. And you can import this in, and it sets it all up for you. Open API, it was formerly called Swagger, as you can kind of see on the top there. I know it's small, but it doesn't seem to be getting any bigger. Um, you can just import this file, and it scaffolds out your whole API layer. It's really pretty impressive. But what's even cooler is API Connect has this UI assemble panel where you can, nah, I was afraid of that, let's see. No, okay, let's see if that just stays with me. Um, you can like drag and drop different things that you may want to happen. So in this instance, where, um, let's see, what's a good example? So one of the things that you build is the Slack command where you say, uh, um, hello world, or how does it work? You, I, I think you just message the bot and it responds. You message the bot with a, a phrase and the bot, the Slack bot responds with you saying, I know your name, it's this, and this is what you said to me. And so this is the, the code here for it. It basically just gets the, the, the code from Slack and then uh, I think it does some verification. It's kind of hard to see in, in this uh, blown up view. And basically processes the command. You can see this is where it's calling out to OpenWhisk to, uh, to, to, to um, uh, process the command from Slack. And, and then it responds with it. So the, the assemble panel is really cool. Uh, another example that I saw that was uh, pretty impressive is an application where you had a shipping API endpoint, but you wanted to basically take the different shipping options and return them in one. And so you could go into this assemble panel, make a request to UPS and make a request to FedEx, get the rates based on the uh, destination, and then merge the data because they're probably going to come back in different shapes and kind of merge them to, to one uh, um, shape that's good for your application in the web view and return that back. So you can basically make these two calls, merge them, and return them. And you can do it all in this really nice UI panel. Um, what else did I want to talk about in terms of the assembly stuff? Yeah, I mentioned the API stuff, the API. Um, so what I, 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 do I, do I do one? Hang on, I just want to see what I'm getting out So I wanted to also just show you how, where am I talk about that? Oh, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Okay, I'll skip that. So I recommend, even if you're not a programmer, looking up that, that Slack integration thing, because it's really cool. <coughs> Let me see, I think I have it set up in one of these. Uh, so, what is it? Um, I'm trying to remember what I called it. Oh, you know what? So, based on, based on that tutorial, uh, another colleague and I are writing this um, bot for, we're, we're both evangelists, and we want to be able to see like what uh, call for speakers are ending soon, so we can make sure we submit our, our talks and go speak at these cool conferences. And so we created this one for finding out what conferences are, are oh, okay. Well, at least they responded. Oh, you probably can't see that. So I said, I'm gonna close this too. No, just go away. Um, I said, Q events asking, and this is a, you know, we're kind of just working on this. I'm basically asking like what events are coming up that uh, the CFPs are still open so I can submit my talks and go talk at the conference. Unfortunately, uh, with our data set that we're using, which we started a couple months ago, all the CFPs are already closed. But in a previous example, there would be like three of them there and say like, you know, Node Interactive in Vancouver, the CFPs closing in, in April or what have you. Question? Yeah, uh, I a quick question for you. We recently built something like a very similar to chatbot type deal, uh, but we use text message and next one API. And I was curious, how difficult do you think it would be to pull something like this off Slack and put it on another platform, like if you're just to do you know, an SMS or if you're going to do Facebook, because that's a big thing how apparently the chatbots do. Yeah, I, I think the, the great thing is that with, the, with, with using APIs, it's actually quite easy because the integration part is sort of outside of that. So for example, in this setup, there's Slack, and there's essentially API Connect, which is managing my APIs. Behind API Connect is the OpenWhisk serverless stuff. 
and also like a database that's kind of managing uh, bot registrations, but it's primarily the open WISC serverless stuff. So since you have that API interface, which is another, thank you for the question, I didn't plan this, but it's a, another reason why I think APIs are the way to go because no matter what the integration is, it's already set up there for you. I mean, you may need to, to kind of clone it and tweak it slightly for what, what, what this integration uh, is going to send you, but I, I think you could be smart enough to, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, you know, Alexa, what have you, um, you can set it up in a way that, that you know, your API can work regardless of the integration. Yeah. Did you use, uh, you use that via the AI platform for um, Not yet, but we're working on that. We've got a couple of ideas that we want to, we, we'd like to build like a conversational interface um, with Watson and um, I, I want to like figure out, some of it's kind of silly, but like weather stuff. So you can always add more features, right? What's that? I said you can always add more features. Yeah. Than you have these ideas. Yeah, this is fun. This, you know, it's, it's, it's useful for us as evangelists to kind of show it off. But I also am building, uh, as a part of a workshop, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I play in bands. And so I'm building this like band platform for like managing your shows and, and, and a number of things. And, and trying to figure out a way to make it uh, um, uh, like use use some of the Watson stuff. I want to build out like a tour a tour assistant, so it'll tell you the mileage between the different shows, the, um, uh, the, the what you can calculate for gas costs to go around, uh, the weather you know along your tour route, and kind of all those sorts of things. So yeah, I'm trying to be creative with the things that I do. And, and convert them into you know things to uh, present on and, and show the technologies. So yeah, it's fun. I, I need to update the data so that that's more awesome. Um, so where was I? Yeah, <clears throat> but I, as I was saying before, I recommend people check out that Slack integration because it's super simple and it's just kind of like you know copy this, paste it there, do that, and then in like less than an hour you have a Slack integration. Who here is not using Slack? That's what I thought. Um, okay, great. Uh, so I showed the assemble panel, and then I just wanted to, oh, uh, because I'm not in presentation mode, I showed you all of those at once. Um, I was gonna show you the, uh, oh, how, how API Connect works when, when you have, um, so when you wanna take your APIs and make them available not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have to be public, available to other parts of your uh, organization application. You can do so by packaging them up in what is called products. So as you can see here, I'm in my APIs tab, and that's my uh, OpenWisk Slack API. But if I switch over to products, I published uh, those couple of Slack endpoints as this one product, right? And we get in here and we can see that I only have one default plan, right? So you can package up any number of uh, APIs into these products. It's not like a one-to-one -one or you, know, you, don't, you can only have one API in, in one product. It's many-to-many. -many. And, and then once you build your products, you can set up these different plans. So say for example, uh, let's see, I will do one that is the gold plan, and it's unlimited. Um, yep, and then this one we'll say is uh, silver, and we're going to rate limit this one. There we go. There. Uh, so we'll say, you know, a thousand calls uh, every day. Right, and then the default plan is just 100 calls an hour, so I don't know which one's actually better. But anyway, you see what I mean, right? So we set up these, these plans. I'm gonna save all of those. And silver, oh, I guess I have to change this too. So silver. And you can see how, like, if you were looking to make um, 
your API is public, how useful this would be for API developers to build on top of your platform, right? So you can see over here on the left side, uh, I've got gold, silver, and, and, and the default lamb. Now, I, uh, let's see, do I need to push this? I can't remember, we'll see. I don't want to do it now in case it takes a moment. Um, so if I go to, yeah, I think I actually do. Anyway, so we, we may not see, no, I'm going I'm to do it. I'm going to roll the dice here. We're, we're live coding, we're live doing stuff. Okay, it's being staged. So now I go to my sandbox, right? This is my sandbox. So this is like, in Bluemix you can have different environments. By default it just gives you the sandbox to kind of play in. But a conventional setup would be like dev, uh, staging, and prod, you know, and you kind of just promote your code to different staging environments. And, and there are actually some really cool tools uh, what we call tool chains to make it all automatic and run your test suite and everything. It's really pretty cool. <coughs> so this was staged. And while I'm talking, I'm just going to publish it. And so hopefully that will be available to me in a moment. Um, but as you can see in here, uh, and I'm not used to it just being the icons, but so I might have to click on my and see. Uh, settings, I think it's pretty nice. So what's really cool about API Connect is it has this built-in developer portal. So when you publish your APIs uh, publicly, you can turn on this developer portal, which I oh I thought I turned this one on earlier. Oh, okay, um, but I think I have another one already set up. Right? Where was that one? Here. Okay, great. So I did this on the train, running running into the uh, city. And I think if I hit publish now, it takes like 20 minutes for it to, to republish the portal. So I'm going to uh, just use this one and hopefully it'll work. Um, so, so this is the developer portal that comes out of the box with API Connect. It's just a Drupal server, uh, Drupal application. So you can um, get in there and, and, and modify it however you see fit. It's just a Drupal app. You can theme it. You can you know, get in there and put in, put in all your um, logos and whatnot. But out of the box, you get this, this full like, Drupal app. And, and uh, apparently, this works. So you can see I have a gold plan, a silver plan, and a default plan. And if I had an application registered here, uh, I could just click the subscribe and, and, um, and, and get to work on, on this public API. And one of the cool things, too, that's kind of getting to the, um, to the world domination bit is that uh, we're working on uh, a monetization aspect. Right now, you, you have to use a third party to, to hook in to like basically send your data to, and then they'll uh, generate the, uh, you know, manage all of the uh, subscriptions and the payments and everything. Uh, you'll still have to do a little bit of that, but we're, we're handling a lot more of the monetization aspect and we can just hook up a third party in terms of actually handling the, uh, the payments. So, so that, that part to me is really pretty awesome. Like the whole developer portal bit and, and, and it, it kind of gets back to what I was talking about at the beginning. Like if you take your application and make uh, um, the, the useful parts of it available to developers, then they will build really cool things on top of them. And they'll mix them up and they'll, you know, they'll they'll probably write you and say, well, I need I need this part of it so I can build this really cool application. And you're like, wow, I didn't even think about that for my company, you know? So it kind of gets back to the earlier story about going out to dinner. You know, if everybody made these these uh, APIs publicly available and allowed these sort of rich integrations, we could really like have this amazing user experience for our for our, uh, for our users. So I think that's really how we end up dominating the world with our APIs. I think, I think that's all I got. I, I think I spoke for a long time, but I'll take questions and you know we can, we can talk over uh, the remaining slice of pizza. Um, uh, yeah, thank you for listening. Good question. Um, 
So to be, to be uh, uh, one, to get kind of into the nitty gritty of code, and also to be frank with you, the express routing model is not great uh, when you have lots of, of, of um, different routes, which, which you do, I mean, not a lot when, you're, when you have a simple API, but if you have a more rich API, the routing itself is kind of a bottleneck. But that's one of the things that we're re-architecting in the next version of Bootback. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be on Express. Um, maybe some parts of it will, but we are redoing the router. We may use another, you know, uh, a different router for ourselves, or we may write our own router. But that's like one performance bottleneck that I know of. I think the rest of it, uh, in terms of connecting to data sources, I, I don't know of uh, any performance. And is most of this set up to um, manage real-time data, or is it more like static data? That, that's a good question, and that's something that I've been wanting to dive in further with. We can talk about it a little bit offline, and I can do a little more research for you, because that's, um, yeah, real-time data is something that I've been wondering about as well, how to really make use of uh, good real-time data. Anyone else? And again, I'll, I'll hang out for a bit, so if you want to... Any questions on the hackathon? Oh, yes, the hackathon. So that's a good... Thanks for bringing that up, Mario. So I'm working with Mario on this hackathon. One thing I want to point out is it's not an overnight hackathon, which I hate. I'm not, you know, 22 years old anymore. Oh. <laughs> you, can, you can go home and work all night if you want to. It's like you, you, you don't have to you don't have to go home. You can't stay here. Um, but yeah, it's going to be fun. Uh, we're bringing in a couple other uh, IBM groups. Um, can we uh, relay on that? Uh, yes, and, and a couple of people already said yes. I mean, Luke and Remco are going to come. They're Lumix uh, advocates, uh, but they're also very well rounded in all the different technologies that you can use uh, serverless and, and, and Python and, and Watson, particularly. Um, and I also have uh, a friend of mine who's on the Watson data team who's going to come and run a workshop. Um, so it's going to be a lot of fun, and I think it's uh, it, it's going to be have a good mix of people, you know, product people, designers, developers, uh, all working together to kind of build uh, applications. So I think it, it should be a really good event. Yeah, it's free to free free to attend yeah. and uh, lots of food and prizes. Yep. Yeah. So I was going to say, as far as prizes go, are you guys looking for sponsors? Yeah. You think we're pretty locked in? I mean, we have like 10k passion prizes. A lot. That's all pretty so 5k top prize for top team. Um, we have a second and third prize, and then we have my new favorites. Yeah, yeah um, a couple uh, product-focused uh, rewards as well. And it'll be here. It'll be here for um, Friday evening, June 2nd. We'll have some food, some drinks. We'll have uh, a couple of workshops like this, but also uh, other, the other different products. <laughs> um, and then we run all day Saturday. I think they, they shut down during 10, 3, 10, 30 at night, which is, I think, that's fair. It's fair. Go home. <laughs> And then you can build your teams ahead of time. You don't have to show yep. up and, um, and do the formation. But if you're an ideas person, you're welcome. You <coughs> just got to find some developers. Yeah, yeah. And we'll, we'll help with that too. Yeah, what, what kind of uh, things are you expecting out of a hackathon like that? We're not really prescribing it. You know, it's not like a finance hackathon or, or um, IoT. It's just. <coughs> I mean, we're calling it API first because I'm on an API team and we paid the money to, to sponsor it. But it's uh, it's pretty wide open. Um, we're we're uh, we'll be there to support you and and um, uh, do some workshops on like APIs. But like I said, we'll also have stuff on uh, Watson and and uh, Bluemix and you know, some of the other. Uh, I'm hoping to get some mobile people there as well. So uh, it's really good. So uh, we might have some idea categories. Just okay. to kind of get your juices flowing, but there's no set parameters. Okay, and, and it doesn't have to be for mobile apps, it could be front-end apps, yeah. single-page applications, stuff like that? Yeah. Right. Yes. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, do you have any description of what this kind of Uh, yes. 
Eventbrite? Yeah, you can pull it up right now. It's on Eventbrite. On uh, Eventbrite. Uh -huh. uh, I don't think we put it up on Meetup yet, but because I wanted everyone to, to actually put it in there. Because we, we have like seats for developers, seats for idea people, and seats for UI and designer people. Um, at least understand where you're coming from. Let's see if I can find this real quick. You go to your first, just yeah, just take your mobile right. first, like uh, API first. There we go. <coughs> oh, if you go to mobile Monday.us, it's on the new show, it's on the app, and then not the one. There we go. Mobile Monday.us, it'll be at the very, very top of the website. Mobile Monday.us. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Yeah, it's Yeah, it should be fun. Thanks, Mario. Thank you. Um, we can hang out for a while again. Yeah, yeah. Any more questions? But we're gonna hang out. We're gonna go to the place for a while. So. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.